You can't escape the time frame you're in, but you can push the fence. Boundaries were a fact of life most girls accepted, and many had no problem with traditional direction. But for a few, expected direction could be problematic. Those that, that went beyond that had to be rebels. They had to be rebels. Fifteen-year-old Mary Lee saddled her pony and rode through the darkness toward church. Maybe her parents stayed home because they were tired from harvesting the fields, or maybe she hadn't told them where she was headed. She might have whistled or hummed as she crossed the pastures, but she kept going. A revival had come to town, and Mary Lee meant to be there. When the preacher spoke of salvation, several left their pews to kneel at the mourner's bench. Mary didn't move. She remained there, but something caught within her soul. It was then on that night I felt assured of a divine call. But on account of the teaching of that time regarding women's ministry, I decided there would be no opening for me, at least not in my homeland. Mary was born into a society being reshaped by the Civil War, struggling with surrender, clinging to tradition. We were one of the last states to let women have the vote, to let women serve on the jury. No way could a woman be equal to a man. But that's Alabama. Everybody had a place in this society. Blacks were to be subservient to white. Children were to be subservient to parents, and women were to be subservient to men. Well, whenever there was food served, of course, the women did that. And then for a while, they used to make, when there was a funeral in town, there were no florists. They used to gather and make the floral designs. They used to decorate the church for weddings. All my life, I can recall seeing women in auxiliary positions in the church as well as in my society. When you don't see women represented in high places and in places of importance like that, you begin to become convinced that perhaps uh, it always was the way, perhaps it is the natural order of things, perhaps that's what was meant to be, perhaps that is the natural design. There was this fear that if any sector of society stepped out of its assigned place, that somehow, like, like a series of, of falling dominoes, that, that society would start unraveling. I opened up my heart to my mother, telling her of my call to preach and my intention to obey it. She gave me no encouragement, but on the contrary, opposed me bitterly, saying she would rather have me go to my grave. For 2,000 years, we have discriminated against women, kept women out of positions of leadership. And in my church, the first woman did not get legally ordained until 1977. That's not ancient history. As we look at the early Christian community, when women participated fully and in equal partnership with men as preachers, as teachers, as directors, as the owners of the house communities, we begin to get a sense of the partnership of the communities and uh, the co-equal participation of both men and women. And we realize that's the way early Christianity was. And it was only with the later accretion of hierarchical patriarchal patterns that we get an elimination, obliteration, omission of the testimony of women in those early centuries. For example, if you take the uh 16th chapter of Romans. We have a number of women mentioned there who are fellow servants of St. Paul who labored in the gospel. They were quite clearly ministers of the gospel. And they are of quite big status. Now take uh, Eunia, who was a, a woman, and she's an apostle and a kinsman of St. Paul, so he knew her quite well. But unfortunately, in the text we have from the fourth century, Eunia is turned into a man, Eunias. 
And we have the same thing elsewhere in the New Testament, like Nympha was a woman, but uh, they turned it into a man, Nymphas. Now, I ask myself, why did they object to women presbyters and a woman apostle? Uh, and why did they have to doctor the New Testament in order to conform to their prejudice against women? There are a lot of uh, theories and opinions about this or that way something got changed or, or whatever. The difficulty that we have is that this textual tradition continues on for a while. We don't have the, a complete version of the New Testament before third or fourth century. So uh, we, we don't know, uh, we don't have a single word of an original text of one book of the New Testament. And there are all these variations. They are very small. And the variations would not change any doctrine of Christianity. But they, they do sometimes bear on some of these interpretive matters. And it's very complex to go back and look at it. I knew to go out in this country as a woman preacher would mean to face bitter opposition, prejudice, slanderous tongues, my name cast out as evil, my motives misconstrued, and to be looked upon with suspicion. What a struggle I had. On my face, before God with tears, I pled to be released from my call. It was not uncommon for there to be rumors that they had abandoned their husbands or abandoned their children. These were attempts to uh, undermine their ministry, to force them back into social conformity. I knew there was not so much reproach attached to going as a missionary. I came to the conclusion that my call was to the foreign field where I supposed a woman would have freedom in preaching. Women find niches of ministry in places where men won't go. And that's a classic theme of Alabama evangelical life. Uh, men won't go to China, men won't go to Africa. Women will go to China, women will go to Africa. And women go there partly because they're called of God, but I also wonder if maybe women go there because they're not men to restrict what they can do. It was only when women were called to stay here in America that there was a problem. I was reared a timid country girl, conscious of my inability. I had never been out in the world, had never seen a railroad train until past 20. In fact, until 27 years of age, had never been outside of my native Alabama county. What I remember about her, she was just just an average talking person. She wasn't a loud person. And she was, I thought, a very pretty lady. She wore long dresses. They was gathered and no telling how many yards in the skirt. And she was real, she was a pretty person, wore hair up, but she was a real attractive person. Uh, she developed an intense interest in trying to bring all of her classmates uh, to a point of profession. Over the course of the next 18 months, all of them did in fact make a profession of faith. And she also came from that experience uh, telling members of her family that she had a call to service on the foreign field, to missionary work. Uh, immediately she encountered opposition from within her family, her mother in particular was very bitter and uh, in her opposition. And she says in her autobiography that at a, at, at a, after a while... I gave in to the social pressure and ceased to speak of it. But all the time the call was there. About five years later, she had another revival experience, what uh, was often called being reclaimed. Again, uh, as she discussed her sense of call, with members of her family, there was, there was again bitter opposition, even stronger than before. One brother-in-law said that if she persisted in this, that her own nieces and nephews would not be allowed to call her Aunt Mary. I was horrified. Um, I've become a little bit more used to reading these sorts of accounts because many female preachers in their narratives describe feeling as if they wanted to commit suicide. 
and she wrote in her memoir that she said, Lord, anywhere but here. She just couldn't imagine standing in that, that masculine space of the pulpit. I think it's very important to understand that in Southern evangelicalism, the pulpit is curiously enough right in the center of the church. The center of religion tends to be the pastor, the preacher. He stands in the middle and he proclaims the gospel and this is the center of what things are all about. In the liturgy of Catholic traditions, and I mean by that the Lutherans and the Roman Catholics and the Orthodox and the Anglicans or the Episcopalians, the liturgy is the center of worship and the priest is thought of as representing God in leading the worship of the people. Now if the priest is representing God and the priest is male and all of the images of God are masculine images, Father, King, Lord, Master, all male images, then you get the sort of idea that built into that religious tradition is the assumption that to be God is to be male. Ministry is best served when you've got a real compliment. Uh, so you can have a very decided structure that appears to be um, hierarchical or, or masculine. And then you could have um, a more feminine model of ministry, which in many ways is very circular. And I think that that is the connecting piece. So you need both. I used to tell people that the, the idea that there was something about the male body that made him more godlike than the female is a really strange idea. And the way you demonstrate how strange it is, is you stand a man and a woman in front of you and you remove from the man everything he's got in common with the woman. Head, eyes, ears, nose, throat, esophagus, stomach, lungs, heart, pancreas, liver, knees, kneecaps, feet. Take everything away that he has in common with the woman until you've got the only thing that he does not have in common with the woman. And you stand that present and you say, now, how is it that we think the image of God resides in that? I've never, in, I've never felt um, less than, and uh, I can truly say that I've never really felt that. Um, and the women that I know uh, have never felt it because our calling, the basic calling that we have, the calling uh, or the vocational call from God is to perform um, the, the, the ministry that has been, that we have been uh, asked to do in the name of God. And so I don't feel less than that. I, I, just, I just don't. Now in the Protestant tradition where preaching is the sacrament, the sacrament of the word instead of the sacrament of the altar, then it, you don't have that burden. The burden the Protestants had to face was that so much of the biblical tradition is anti-female when you see um, what appears to be a, a putting down of women in Scripture, actually it, it appears to me to be more of a reflection of the culture of the time, that you know women did cover their heads, so St. Paul would have said that. We also know from St. Paul, for example, how many women he really did have in his in, or in his entourage, people who were supporting his work. And so I couldn't really, I can't really say that I see that as necessarily conflictual. I have decided that what we have all been accustomed to all of our lives has more to do with our opinions than what the dear old Bible says. For example, if we had been accustomed all our lives to hear women preach and had never heard a man preach, then if a big 200-pound man came along preaching, we would all declare that he was out of his place and would feel like saying, let him keep silent. There are these hundreds and hundreds of amazing stories that have just been completely neglected. We don't know them. They weren't recorded. Uh, these women were not trying to call attention to themselves. They were in many ways not trying to record their own life. They were just trying to respond to what they thought was God's call in the world. I had never heard of any female preacher uh, around the turn of the century here. In the Evergreen Baptist Association in the 1880s, this woman appeared at a church and she says, I've been called to preach the gospel. Some of them say, let her speak. I don't know whether she's been called or not, but maybe she has, maybe she hasn't let her speak. The pastor said, no, she cannot speak. That's not biblical. That's not scriptural. And so uh, the congregation overrules the pastor and allows Mrs. Perry to speak. She shows up uh, in another place. 
and the church will not let her preach. And so she goes to the Methodist church and the Methodist church invites her to preach. So here's a small town Methodist church inviting a Baptist self-proclaimed revivalist to preach the gospel. Um, I think it was interesting that there was a woman that had enough guts at that particular point in, in history to uh, stand up and, and do that. Uh, I mean, it was expressly forbidden uh, by the Baptist church at that time. So what happens is Evergreen Association, in which this little church was a member, uh, appointed a committee to discipline the church for this very unusual theological practice of allowing a woman to preach. And apparently they did discipline the church and kick the church out of the association and said that it would not be fellowshipped until it got right with the Lord, which meant essentially with the evergreen male leadership. Well, hierarchy of course means uh, structures of authority. That's the way I define it, is, is structures of decision making and power, which again are always inevitable. In, in any kind of society that somebody finally makes the decisions. Those somebodies always have beliefs and those somebodies who have those beliefs always push them. They pushed Mrs. Perry right out of the pulpit. After Newton, no other records of her exist. Mary Lee's inner debate continued until she thought she found a way to quiet it. Her real instrument of liberation was a young revivalist named Robert Lee Harris. I married him, thinking that by becoming a preacher's wife, I could more easily do the work God called me to. But instead of this, I found it so easy to shift the work upon him. I would sing, pray, do personal work, but left the preaching to him. Some women went out as wives. There's a joke uh, in it's among those who do women's history, particularly in the church, about you know, John Doe and his wife, you never find out the name of the wife because that's not important. There's one classic story of the, this American Episcopal priest and his wife went to Greece. He died six months after they got there, and the wife and her sister ran this school for 30 years, but their names are never mentioned. As time went on, she realized that she was not satisfied, that she still felt guilty because she was not herself preaching. After three short years of married life, my husband was seized with that dreadful disease, consumption of the lungs. One morning while my husband was sleeping, I went upstairs for prayer and communion with God. Lord, if you will heal my husband, I will preach. God seemed to respond. Whether I heal your husband or not, won't you do what I ask? Mary Lee wept, saying to God she could not go out and preach. But hours later, she finally said, yes, Lord. From that day, she never wavered again about her call. Being different was merely a part of her transformation. She would respond to this call alone. Her husband died within days. Like Mary Lee, Sojourner Truth had a message. Sojourner Truth came to Alabama determined to free her son from a planter. Her message was one of freedom on many levels. She was born Isabella, a slave, a black, a woman. Powerlessness was a fact of life. After conversion, she chose a new name to reflect her call and her spiritual journey. Just Being born again offered women another chance, a new identity, empowerment, because it plugged them directly into the ultimate power source, God. I do think we need to think of the church as one of the bridges, the early bridges for women's power. And black power, all the black power came through the church, I practically all of it. Twixt the blacks of the South and the women of the North all are talking about rights that the white man is going to be in a fix pretty soon. The modern woman's movement traces its origins to the Seneca Falls Convention, which took place in a Wesleyan Methodist church in New York State. Y'all 
not to been there. Oh, there was so much pandemonium in the place. Uh, oh, they was talking about women's rights and should they be given the right to vote. Sometimes we, we deal with an almost feminist notion that the right of women to vote was an end in itself. That is hardly the case. I think there were parallels. Uh, I think blacks and women had much in common, although I don't think they realized it. I don't think they ever made common cause very often. And in fact, uh, a lot of white uh, suffrage leaders in Alabama were always concerned lest their black allies who wanted suffrage would embarrass the whole movement. Well, I, I held my seat as long as I could. When I couldn't stand it anymore, I, I got up and I made my way to the platform and I mounted the steps and I could hear all those hissing noises rushing through my ears. The kind of sound that says, you don't belong here. If belonging meant staying inside boundaries, then Mary Lee was no longer... And she didn't turn the colored people down. But Illegal women had been ordained in 1970. And a she, she was glad to be home. Mississippi. 1800 and 1860 says in Alabama could be wrong about slavery, and if they could be wrong about segregation, and if they could be wrong about the right of women to vote, they could also be wrong about or ordaining women. They could. Uh, but that's true every time you change. Remember, Jesus was put to death for challenging the sort of the some of the and she continued preaching until fighting the church. I believe that. You know.